Hello, thank you for joining us for today's discussion, Drive Chat, Establishing Mutually Beneficial Collaboration, Doing Better, Being Better. My name is Nadia Bodkin, and I'm a rare disease experience professional born with three rare genetic conditions myself. In addition to co-founding the Rare Advocacy Movement, I focused the majority of my work in expediting stakeholder collaborations in a manner that allows for therapeutics to get into the hands of the patients that need them, which is why I'm so excited for today's timely discussion. Today, I have the honor of moderating a discussion drive session for four truly dedicated rare disease focused experts. Ono Faber, co-founder and CEO of Rare Base, Lynn Wilson, Vice President of Myositis Support and Understanding, Christopher Misling, CEO of Anavex Life Sciences, and Heather Shorten, founder and executive director of Pompeii Alliance. As active stakeholders in the rare disease ecosystem, each and every one of these expert speakers offer unique insights and opportunities that aim to enhance the lives of people impacted by life-altering rare conditions. The global rare disease ecosystem has evolved significantly since its birth over 38 years ago. And only about 15 years ago, the community consisted mainly of various groups of caregivers, novice to the business of therapeutic development, attempting to organize and raise funds to save the lives of their children. Today, however, we have a dynamic rare disease ecosystem that now also includes professional rare disease patients themselves that have committed their life work to advancing research and expediting therapeutic development with trusted members of industry that are continuously seeking opportunities to be meaningful allies to the people of the rare disease community. So now today is a real treat because all four rare disease focused experts invited to speak today have been specifically chosen because of their wealth of insights in establishing mutually beneficial collaborations between the advocacy and industry landscapes for the overall benefit of the people of the rare disease community. So I'd like to start off today's discussion with Ono. As the co-founder of the Public Benefit Corporation Rare Base and a rare disease person yourself, how have you been able to avoid bottlenecks and align research and therapeutic developments with the needs of the patient community? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a really good question. And I think we should all be probably asking ourselves that question all the time uh, because it's, uh, it is a really tough one to answer in the rare disease space. We all know this, right? Like you have a very small patient group with a, with a quite severe problem, industry might be looking at it, but isn't really able to invest in it yet. And it's sort of, we are all like falling in uh, no, no man's land a little bit. And that's why I uh, started Rarebase with my co-founder, Omid Karkudi, uh, because we, we both had that experience and we felt like we need a way to almost have a biotech company, a very, very therapeutic focused for all these rare diseases when nobody else is interested yet. So we partner with the foundations that uh, sponsor some of the research, but we have scientists and with the drug development experience and we run everything like a virtual biotech company would. So the funding gap is one thing to be able to do something. Unfortunately, the only groups that can bridge it right now are the patient advocacy groups when it comes to therapeutic research. But also there are so many other things like, for example, research materials that are generated in the course of finding drugs and drug development. We want to make them uh, accessible right, to other collaborators and researchers because you can have an idea, you generate materials along the way, but it's likely that the idea doesn't work right, because we are not able yet to fully predict uh, human biology. So at least those materials that are generated can be reused by us, of course, but also by other people that might have other ideas. And the only way to do that is also if you cover the costs of generating those materials in collaboration with the patient advocacy groups. Because as soon as we would put money into these research materials, we would have an incentive to sell these assets to regain our investment. So the investment has to be the patient community in the very early stages. So there's lots to talk about, but one thing I've learned is that for a drug or a therapy, whatever modality it is to be successful, so many things have to go right. It's a really thin path forward. And one of these things don't go right, you will just not have the therapy. For example, the inability to measure the success of the therapy can be a reason. It can be that there's at some point no more money or investment interest in the therapy. It can be that it just doesn't seem good enough or there are like other decisions. Maybe there is another opportunity that's better. So we mapped it all out. 
like what are the ways things can fail and how can we create another path forward for these ideas if they are good because it's not always the idea that makes something fail so you're doing really great work to bring the power to the advocacy space to repurpose these clinical platforms that might have failed in one direction but could actually succeed in another. So that's amazing. And Christopher, also from the biopharmaceutical space, how are you and your team at Anavex Life Sciences introducing real world patient insights into the therapeutic development process? It's a very good question, uh, Nadia. The key point, what I noticed when we interacted with the advocacy group, in our case, it was with the Red Syndrome Foundation, which covers Red Syndrome, which is a horrible disease, affect mostly girls with the impairment of speaking and walking and other disabilities. And we noticed that the key driver was really the lack of time. The patients, the parents, they want very quick treatment options and expedite if something is possibly working by uh, showing a preclinical model, uh, showing results. And so once it, that was established, you know, there is really the desire to immediately test it in patients as quickly as possible. What we did was systematically knowing that you have a limited window here of time, but also as previously mentioned by Ono, you have really the dilemma that everything has to work out. We made sure in our case, instead of just rushing into a trial to actually involve the parents of these children, of these girls in the design of the clinical trial. And we were able to ask question, what would be detrimental for them to choose to join a trial or not? And we found that one of the key features was the problem of transportation for these girls. So the ability to find alternatives to move them to a site was very welcome. So we included in our trial design in the protocol, the ability to choose between going to the site of the hospital or also receiving the assessment at their respective home. And that was a key feature among also reducing the number of visits to begin with. And we included all of these things in the trial. And interesting enough, during COVID, you can imagine that optionality was extremely welcomed because nobody was able to leave the house for a while. And we actually were able to uh, recruit even faster the study than we thought. So this is really what I think was important to balance this desire of doing things quickly, but at the same time as intelligently as possible and including the patients in the design from very early on stages. Thank you, Christopher. That's, and that's quite the lesson that working with the advocacy space and inputting those insights actually served the best interest of the actual clinical trial during a global pandemic, which is just even a real world evidence of the importance of working with the patient advocacy landscape. And we actually have two rare disease leaders from the advocacy space also on our panel, Lynn and Heather. Working in the rare disease advocacy landscape, it's often communicated that it is the responsibility of those of us in the patient advocacy landscape to speak the language of both the community and the biopharmaceutical landscapes in order to facilitate meaningful partnerships that are beneficial to all stakeholders involved. So I'd like to ask Lynn and Heather the following question. As a patient advocacy leader, how have you and your team positioned your organization to establish meaningful partnerships with industry stakeholders? Again, a great question. What we try to do is cultivate a working relationship with our stakeholders to the point where we consider people like Ono a part of our myositis family. And I'll talk a little bit more about our relationship because I think it speaks to both what Ono says and what I say from a patient advocate group. We gravitate toward those stakeholders who have the same values and mission that we do, which is what we're doing is for the best of the patient. So we're always working toward the common good. One of the things that actually having a rare disease gives you is insights into your community. And anytime that we as patient advocates can align with the stakeholder and bring the patient's perspective 
and the voice of the patient into the equation, along with actually being the stakeholder. It just makes for better science and better collaboration. Cultivate the relationship. Let's go back to that. Because they're family, we don't always get in touch with them because we want to talk about the project. We get in touch with them because we want to know about them, how they're doing, and what their life is about. So we establish, I think, a level of of trust and commonality in the way we approach the relationship. And finally, I guess one of the things that we try to do is bring uh, the best that we can to the relationship, to the project. We have a very work ethic. We're very flexible and adaptable. And um, we always strive to do better. And we look for feedback because one of the great things for us is that There are times when we think, gee, we should be doing this, or we should be doing that. Sometimes the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence. We want to be like that group. And one of the things we ask our stakeholders, what can we do better? And the answer that we get is just keep doing what you're doing. So that sort of drives us in our relationship. Thank you for sharing that. The advocacy space can be a really beautiful environment, um, especially when we approach each other collaboratively and give each other opportunities to learn from each other. And just even as rare disease people ourselves, you know, just a rare disease experience forces you to be innovative. And so, you know, that's what we bring to the professional environment as well. So Heather, the same question, as a patient advocacy leader, how have you and your team positioned your organizations to establish meaningful partnerships with industry stakeholders? Uh, So thank you for the question. Pompeii Alliance was started to be a community service organization. Many of the partnerships I have now were formed out of connections I made before I founded Pompeii Alliance. I made these connections by attending rare disease conferences and participating in industry roundtables. I learned people's names and I asked for business cards. After the founding of Pompeii Alliance, I reached out to those industry stakeholders now as the executive director of a patient organization. We have assisted other patient organizations in expanding their advocacy work, which also allows for us to build our networks and form new partnerships. I am constantly doing research to find other organizations and stakeholders that might be interested in working with us. So the key for me is, it sounds really simple, but it has been beating the pavement. That's what it has been. Like I said, that a lot of these partnerships I have now were formed from attending rare disease events and roundtables, Pompeii disease events, and just getting to know people. My parents have always said, I'll talk to anybody. And that has been a blessing for me in starting this organization, because I will talk to anybody. I was in an elevator during rare disease week, and there were these people were also there as part of rare disease week and i just started talking to them you know i was like how's your day going you know it was late in the afternoon everybody's tired and one of the men in the group he said um so what disease do you represent and i say i have pompeii disease and he was like you really and you know like then he went on about pompeii disease and i was so impressed that he knew something he knew john crowley And, you know, so, you know, like literally, like, you know, how they talk about your elevator speech. So literally I had my elevator speech and he gave me his business card. And of course this was in February. So it was before everything shut down. And he was like, yeah, we're going to have this event and you should really come. And so it was literally like just talking to somebody in the elevator and just asking them how their day was going. And really, it sounds not scientific at all, but that's really what it is. It's personal connection. So I don't ever look at a person and say, that person can't help me. Also, it's a great opportunity to be able to just help somebody else. And maybe this person isn't a part of your rare disease community, but they are looking for connections for themselves or their patient organization. And sometimes you can help them do that. Thank you, Heather. And as our time comes to a close, I have one more question that I'd like all of you to lend your insights to. As real world conscious stakeholders active within the rare disease ecosystem, what is one piece of advice that you can offer other rare disease stakeholders (laughs) 
seeking to develop mutually beneficial collaborations within the advocacy and community-based landscapes? That's a really uh, interesting question. And I can say that I'm always wearing many hats. Like I'm a patient, a rare disease patient. I'm working in the industry. Uh, I have been on multiple uh, various groups, like uh, with supporting endpoint development, for example, advisory panels involved in patient advocacy activities. So I always like to say, uh, you know, don't grab land, but build roads. Um, I think it is ultimately a people's uh, game. And in the end, it's us doing it together. And we shouldn't forget that. Like you can have uh, companies and you can have like all kinds of labels and organizations and institutions, but ultimately it's about people. Thank you, Ono. And Christopher, what piece of advice would you like to offer the rare disease stakeholders seeking to develop mutually beneficial collaborations within the advocacy and community-based landscapes? There are two things I would recommend. One thing, the major one is that really the focus is the patient. It seems to be obvious, but what I noticed when you go into a project and you get uh, distracted by the details that you lose the oversight of that, and you have to remind your team as well as yourself and everybody who is involved, the CROs, the physicians, the nurses, that really the focus is on the patient. What would it mean for the patient a journey to go to a clinical study? And the advocacy does a very good job because they know that's the focus, but it's important for them to remind all these stakeholders, all these participants in such a project that the focus is the patient. Thank you, Christopher. And Lynn, what piece of advice would you offer rare disease stakeholders? seeking to develop collaborations? I would say that the most important one is to be authentic. You know, stay true to the organization culture and the values that you have. Live your mission every day in every service that you provide and with every decision that you make. You know, your community is your lifeblood and drives what you do. And I guess the last thing is we know that change is here. And everyone needs to learn to embrace change. Be audacious, be bold. And within that context, then what you will find is that there are lean that you can lean into lots of new opportunities and new possibilities. Beautifully said, Lynn. Heather, take us home with your insight. <laughs> so I would say you must be willing to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to promote yourself as well as your organization. It's important to find your niche. I'm a social worker. I come from a social work background. So my niche is advocacy and resources. And so I know how to do those things. And so for me, it was just the next step to putting that into a patient organization. Also, listen to each other. Talk to people. I've said, I said it before, don't be afraid to talk to people. That is how you're going to make your connections and your partnerships. And you'll meet wonderful, wonderful people. You'll hear incredible stories, but you have to beat the pavement. You really do. And it's a lot of work, but necessary because then it makes advocacy not so cold. We strive to be patient driven, family driven. So it makes us more than just research. We, we bring it to the human level. We take it from it being research to a human level. And with that, we conclude the first community-based stakeholder collaboration zone. This discussion has proven to be a wealth of insights. And on behalf of the Rare Advocacy Movement, I would like to thank the World EPA Congress for hosting the very first community-based stakeholder collaboration zone. And I would like to thank all of you, all of our wonderful panelists for joining and lending their insights to this discussion. I look forward to continuing these vital discussions and engaging in more collaborative dialogue in the future. And I hope to see all of you at the Living Rare After Party. Thank you very much for today's discussion drive chat. Your work does not go unnoticed.